My next guest for this segment is a Yorkville legend and Canadian music icon. She's a vocalist, songwriter, producer, and instrumentalist. Please welcome Juno Award winner, Kathy Young. Tell me about your latest performance that took place mid COVID pandemic. Well, it was in Niagara Falls and it was a little different, Julia, because I sung to pre recorded tracks. And that was different. I, I have done that before. I did that in Mexico and I did one set. Well, this was two sets. So it was a little long for pre recorded tracks. I think I personally would prefer a band, but. Mm. The audience was really happy, very supportive, and they said it didn't matter whether the, now I don't believe it didn't matter because it sure mattered, but mm -hmm. they were really supportive. It was a great show. I did everything on my favorite artists, Chuck Khan, Aretha Franklin, Steely Dan, uh, songs I hadn't been able to do before, and some originals, I played my harp. I actually walked out in the second half in a black, uh, robe with all kinds of beading on it and and wow. I had <laughs> I had found a sale the day before or just that day I'm like a crow anything that's uh, glitter I'm gonna go for Julia so I I grabbed this thing and, and I went oh look it's an Egyptian headpiece and it was all beaded a skull cap and and things that came down well that was the back I turned it around they're all in my face it was beautiful so I came up with the robe this and a glitter mask underneath and like I was lost and I walked on stage and I said wow I said there the plane must have made a left turn somewhere this is in Abu Dhabi you recently wrote a song or I uh, started re-recording a song called wash your hands can you oh. tell me about that so Brian Master called me on the phone we were talking and we were talking about funny songs and he said Oh, I've got an idea. He says, how about this? You know the old song, the bow marks, clap your hands. It's a song from the 1963. And I happen to know this song my whole life. I'll keep it really short. It's been playing in my life. I ended up recording an album with the artist who wrote the song. And I used to come home from school every day and pantomime to it. So it was kind of like in my blood. And he said, do you know the song? I said, do I know it? He said, yeah. He says, well, how about this? Instead of just clap your hands, clap your hands. How about just wash your hands, wash your hands. And I said, that's so brilliant. And immediately I wrote the song, wash your hands, wash your hands. And I thought, well, that's great. Uh, I didn't really have a lot of help to get it in the studio. So finally, I just sat down with a guitar and put it on Facebook. And the CEO, Mark Garner of the Downtown Young BIA, saw it and said, hey, that should be a PSA, public service announcement. I said, bingo, you got it. You make the magic happen. You wanna play? He said, sure. So I got all my friends together that were on the mural that I'm a part of, the mural of, uh, done by Adrian Hales. It's the second tallest in the world. And we got Ronnie Hawkins, believe it or not, to, I, I went out to his house to shoot him. We're old buddies, he was so kind. Uh, unfortunately, Gordy Lightfoot's people said, absolutely not. <laughs> they kept him in the house as rightly they should. He's a, you know, a national treasure. He doesn't take the risks that Ronnie did uh, his whole life. So, you know, he really wanted to save everything and we respected that. So he gave us his good wishes and as did Robbie Robertson. So we ended up with uh, uh, Greg Godovitz from Gatto, George Oliver, John Finley, Jay Douglas, and moi. 
and we sung this song and we shot it and uh, put it out there and people really liked it. A lot of fun. It's a very serious message. Kind of the iron fist in the velvet glove. Wear your mask, wash your hands and stay alive. So have you always been this musical? Because I remember uh, you were just mentioning clap your hands and you're singing to it as a child. So when did, when did the, all this music start for you? I was three years old. I sung Jesus Loves Me on the 501 uh, Queen car, <laughs> street car with my mom. And I don't know, I just burst into song. And I, I do remember like it was yesterday, the whole street car stopped and applauded. I'd never heard applause before. And a man come up, old man, and he gave me a butterscotch candy, which was safe to do in those days. And ever since then, I, I said I've been a sucker for applause and butterscotch. You're mentioning at three years old, you're performing on a streetcar. Have you always lived in Toronto? Oh yes, I was born here. I'm an East York baby. My mother was born in North Bay, my dad, Toronto, and my grandfather. Toronto. We're a third generation Canadian, but I'm a Toronto girl at heart and very proud of her. Now, the Yorkville area is that you frequented a lot, um, especially in your youth and probably still now. Can you tell me about what that area means for music? Well, I moved there when I, I started hanging out when I was 15 and I moved there when I was 16. And I played there at the Minor Bird. It was the beginning of my own style, my own finding my own voice, let's put it that way. I used to sing on the street, but if somebody tried to give me money, I'd close my guitar case. I got really offended. I'm still trying to equate money and music today. Today's music in Yorkville, it, it, before then, let me go, it was amazing. We had clubs everywhere. We had bands everywhere. There wasn't, if the musician said, if you didn't have a gig on Saturday night, you didn't show up in Yorkville because that showed that you weren't working. All the musicians were working. And Yorkville was a mixed bag. You could go to the grab, you could go to the riverboat and see folk, folk rock. You could go to the El Patio and see the latest in rock bands. The Penny Farthing, the greatest jazz. They had Sunday jazz with incredible performers like Jackie Shane uh, and, and amazing people. It was, they, then they had the little discos that came in. It was just music, 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 happening, 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 everything. Until 1969. And then it stopped. It got redeveloped into kind of like a posh place where people really didn't feel too comfortable. Music disappeared. It's still done. People don't play in Yorkville, but we're going to fix that. I'm the alumni, uh, part of the, the alumni of the, the Yorkville, Spirit of Yorkville alumni. And we're going to put a mural up. We've been working on it the way we, it was done on York, Young Street. I, uh, Adrian has sketched it in and we're working very hard with the uh, Yorkville BIA and the Young BIA and the Yorkville Residents Association to fill in the gap. Because, it, you know, there's a big difference between the 1800s and, and Yorkville and the international shopping and tourist destination that this has become. The whole there was Yorkville, was the artistic thing. So there is going to be a museum it's in the works now the Yorkville Museum and the murals will be there and soon they'll be interactive and people will be able to hear the history of, of Yorkville and how it affected a culture, it culturally affected the generation. Now, did you ever perform your song Spoonful, which was a very popular song? Did you perform it in Yorkville? Oh, almost every day. Can you tell me a bit more about that song and what that's all about and how that came to be? I was playing on the street. I didn't play that song, but my friend Craig Black was a very um, forethinking man, not somebody who, oh, you're a girl, you can't play with us, you know, that kind of thing. I used to get a lot of 
kind of stuff like that. But he invited me to jam with his band and they played this song. And after that, I owned it. <laughs> it was mine. And he thought that was great. Uh, and that's what happened. I was actually had the opportunity to, to jam with the band and learn about the song. And then um, after I, I, I recorded it, Oh, John Brower calling me from California. Hold on. Johnny. Johnny, I'm on television. You can't talk to me right now. I love you. Okay, bye. They're doing a documentary on John right now on his mm -hmm. uh, festival, the one that John Lennon came to. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Wh which festival was that? That was called the, uh, it was the Rock and Roll Revival. I had the opportunity to meet John and Yoko in the dress room, so they like my story. So it's it's going to be in the documentary too. What a day that was! That's a, that's amazing. We'll have yeah, to read my book, darling. It's going to be quite the book. Mm -hmm. um, speaking speaking of different places that you performed, what has been your favorite place to perform? <gasps> Hard to say. It's like who's been my favorite boyfriend. <laughs> Uh, they all have their characteristics. I, I, I so enjoyed Hong Kong. Now Hong Kong was, I was at a five-star uh, gourmet restaurant, the only dinner show in town. And it was something very special. And I learned, I got an education everywhere I went. Uh, in Hong Kong, the only time I ever had a full Chinese audience, it was different than you know, you finish a song and everybody claps and you go, yeah, yeah, here's another one. But when I was playing for the entire Chinese audience who came in from China, I finished the song to silence. I thought, oh, they didn't like me. Keep going. So I, so I kept going, second song, silence. Oh my gosh, the whole show, they never clapped. And I really was tested to do my show confidently. And it was a great lesson because at the end of the show, <laughs> the whole audience lined up to thank me personally. <laughs> Who would have thought that? And I, oh, wonderful, 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 wonderful. I'm like, ah, now you tell me. But it was a, a great experience. I loved working in Cyprus as well. A lot of uh, English people, a lot of people, Germans, a lot of European people, Russians came down and uh, I got to perform for a lot of people in, from different places in the world in one spot. And I went back there many times, so it was quite nice. Toronto is my home. My favorite place to play, I gotta tell you, I'm not being facetious in any way doing this, saying this. My favorite place to play is home. Aww. home. Because they're my people and they give me the love I need. I don't have to prove anything to them. And when I threw it all over the world, nobody knew who I was. I, second time around, yeah, I got people, but this is my home. And the love I get from my audience, my fans, my friends, there's nothing like it. So there's your answer. So you've mentioned about your favorite performance. Um, can you tell me a story about your favorite after performance moment? You've probably had a lot of adventures uh, through uh, touring and uh, performing at different venues and different places. What has been your favorite after performance experience? Okay, um, when the staff of the Bangkok Hotel, it was a seven-star hotel, actually met Gore Vidal there, that's a nice story. I didn't know it was him. And he really complimented me and I said, oh, thank you so much. Kathy Young, he says, Gore Vidal. <laughs> you know, totally put my chin up in the crane. Um, Bangkok was amazing because after the performance, the staff invited me out to their restaurant where they go together. I was the only Guaylo. Oh, sorry, Bangkok was Farang. Hong Kong was Guaylo. They also, the staff of the Hong Kong, uh, they brought 
me to their restaurant. So there were two after parties with the locals. I was highly honored because they had not done that with any other performer that had ever played there, both countries. So I got to see them. They're wild. They play dominoes, they put the karaoke on, they, they, they have food and they, they just go totally crazy. And the next day you see them at work, no mention of what happened the night before. It's so wonderful. Now, you're a very musical person and not just vocally, but you play a lot of instruments. Can you name a few? Guitar, harmonica, and kazoo. How, how did you learn so many? Or I guess they're a little bit similar. I picked up the guitar at 15. My friend gave me one, so I started playing it. Um, the harmonica, 16. It was given to me by a guy in Yorkville. We used to sit on the steps together. We shared music, everybody. His name, well, he changed his name. We knew him as Sonny, but he ended up being Leon Redbone. Yeah. And uh, we used to play pool together, everything, just many years. But he gave me my first harmonica and the harp stand so I could play like Donovan. You know, I do choruses and stuff. And I just sort of played it a little bit, then I dropped it for many years because I felt funny playing it, you know? It's like, people are staring at me. Why? <laughs> so, and then I picked it up again, the, uh, I'd say 1980 when we were playing at the, uh, the Westbury Hotel and there was a, a guy in from Greece who was putting on a Greek show. And he went crazy because I, I, I was flipping around the place and I played my harmonica and I threw it away and he booked me for the Greek show. <laughs> so so where, I, do, where do you pull your inspiration for your songs and your songwriting from? Is there anyone who inspires you? I've had many muses in my life. And a lot of times I've written songs for people in advance of meeting them. And a lot of songs I've written for no one just because they came to me. I am the vessel. <laughs> I'm the vessel. Well, if you could collaborate with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? It's a uh, hard one. <laughs> Quincy Jones. It's my dream to meet him. Tony Bennett, though he's not singing anymore. Uh, well, you said dead, so it doesn't matter. If, I, I don't mean it doesn't matter. I, mean, I can pick somebody who's not going to happen, right? Um, and Janice Joplin. I love Janice. Janice and I had a lot of similarities. Our two album covers are both of us on motorbikes, and the back covers are almost identical. Who knew? And I, I signed with her company when she went to Columbia Records. I went to Main Street, where she originally was. We had a lot of connections. And she also slept with my boyfriend on the road. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you guys had many connections. <laughs> he, just, he just bragged that he was on the tour, on the train tour. And she was a very lonely girl. He was very good looking, tall, curly English guy. So it was a shoe in for her. <laughs> Well, you never know who you're kind of going to cross paths with or like who knows who. Um, what are some interesting people, who are some interesting people that you've met uh, throughout your path that are maybe kind of notable or who um, who, are, who you just found interesting? Oh, I found a lot of interesting people from the poorest to the richest. Okay, I'll give you a quick one. In um, Cyprus, I was playing I had my own little bar there. I had the entrance way where you walk by. It was a beautiful hotel. It's a five-star hotel. The owner was the foreign minister and they had the G6 summit there. And all the Commonwealth people were there. We had to get Interpol clearance and all those things. And the Sultan of Brunei was there. They walked him through. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't see him. He's only about four foot tall, you know. 
five, sorry, maybe five. And, and, and he went by with a bunch of security guards because they all came to the hotel on a retreat for the weekend, invitation of the prime minister. I also met the two presidents of the country, uh, Kirio uh, Mihalidis introduced me to, uh, Kirio Papandreou, who was the original one, and then um, Kirio Claridis. I have photographs with both. I'm very honored to have that. So, in this in this time, I was singing, and some of the delegates were peering in the door, and they were filling the door. And there was this. I was singing. Uh, I just called to say I love you, and I saw this this woman and I could feel her, Julie, I could feel her. She so wanted to sing. And I thought, oh, okay. And without thinking, I looked at the face beyond her and be, the face beyond her, this big face with a big Cheshire smile. Because I walked up to her with the, with the microphone singing it and just had her sing, not without a word. And it was just music to music. Singer to singer. And I just instinctively knew she was a singer, which she was, I didn't know. So I walked up, gave her the mic to sing and she started to sing beautiful voice. And so I started to harmonize that little chorus and then I wandered away back to my stage and that was that. Next day I got called into the office. I thought, oh, what did I <laughs> Oh no. Oh yeah, oh no. So I sit in the food and beverage director says, Kathy, uh, last night in your bar? I said, yeah. You did a really nice thing. That was the king and queen of Swaziland. And he was, she, she was his newest bride. He's got like a thousand of them or something. But she was the new bride, young, beautiful. And she's a singer. And she really was so happy that I did that. And the main thing was I didn't embarrass them. So they made an official invitation for me to go and visit them anytime I want in Swaziland. I don't want to be part of a harem. I don't think I'm going to go. <laughs> too old now, so I'm safe. It's okay. <laughs> wow. So, uh, who else we got? We got, well, I told you about Gore Vidal. How about Bob Marley? Mm -hmm. I met Bob Marley in 1975 in his home in Jamaica. Um, my manager had gone there to put on a show and we were staying <laughs> at the Prime Minister's brother's estates. Now this is around another time when the Commonwealth, they were having a summit and the Queen was there. And we were looking to have our, our work permits. He was looking for work permits. We were on this fabulous estate. It was just beautiful. And they were worried because they went to the Rastafarians who said they could get work permits for the show people. Uh-uh-uh. Rastas were not the thing back then. They weren't popular. So they were not giving us the work permits. Um, and they investigated us. They had the FBI there. The FBI guy took me to Strawberry Hill where traffic had, Stevie Windwood had just, uh, had just uh, performed and they were recording there. So, and the cloud went right through me, it was so high. We're on a mountain and a cloud went right through me. Oh, that was amazing. And uh, so, you know, he tried to get lucky. Sorry, take me back home. So he took me back home. And when he was there, I'll have to save the rest of the book because I gotta make sure I don't get sued. But it was uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a scene. Uh, we, when I got back there, Michael Manley's uh, aide was there with my manager. My manager had been having a great time with him. That's all I got to say for that. So, and, but while I was there, my manager took me to the uh, road, which is where they live, Bob Marley and the And this is my artist and Bob walked up and he didn't say a word, first time he met me. And handed me a sticker and it said Natty Dread album of the year it had just been released this man was a prophet he knew it, it became album of the year but he knew he made stickers I, it's on my guitar case so, and 
So we sat, sat in their room and said hello. And I got to watch them rehearse. I'll tell you, the air was like jelly. Oh, they're amazing. And then I went home. And then they came to Toronto. Uh, first time they came, not Maple Leaf Gardens. They came to Massey Hall. And, and I went to see them. And uh, I, I went down, I went to the hotel and I brought Bob some welcome material. Yes. <laughs> and he came to the door and they said, Bob, Chiat is here, no. And, and uh, it was Bernard, the chef. Oh, he was so sweet. And Junior, the guitar player. Anyway, he opened it, they opened the door. I, I said, here. And they said, look, Bob. So Bob walked away, came back with a big newspaper, unfolded. <clears throat> <clears throat> and walked away <laughs> the rest of the boys and later on i went to the to the gig sitting beside rita uh, how wonderful i was like there were two three people white people there and we were all on stage and after the show that's another after show which was good but it wasn't my show but we all went back and they drink moss something that's uh made uh to put the protein back as they say it's made with uh uh, Irish moss. You probably know being an Irish girl. <laughs> Irish moss. And uh, they put strawberry flavoring. And all the I3s came in looking like a net full of cello with curlers in their hair and baby dolls. And they came and had their drink and they left. It was so much fun. And we sat for a while and then I left. And I didn't see them again. Didn't see them again till Rita came up on her own. But, um, it was a magical time. The one thing I can say about Bob Marley, when I when I was in Massey Hall, it was the same vibe as being in that shed. You could feel the air. His presence was so thick. You could just grab the air, you know? I've never felt that before from a performer. He was so, he was that powerful. His spirit, just every corner it filled. Now, yeah, may he rest in peace. Wow. Those were some amazing stories. You, you've really lived. Yeah, and I got too many more. You'll have to read the book. It's called Watch Me, Daddy. <laughs> is there a reason why the book is called that name? Mm-hmm. Because all my life I've been trying to get approval from him. Watch me, Daddy. So and I think that a lot of us are like that. I think a lot of people will relate to um, wanting approval from from one parent or another. For me, it was my dad. And never feeling that you really measured up because they only told their friends, but they didn't tell you. Just want to hear I'm proud of you. I actually did hear that once when I read a letter when I was in Hong Kong on the stairs. I was so homesick. My dad sent me a letter, the only one he ever wrote me. And it says, I'm proud of you. Oh, sorry. I'm so proud of you because you're making your dreams come true. And then when I got back, the first thing he said is what he always used to say, get a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opening line of my book. My mother all, off, always said, often said to me, if you stop singing ever, never speak to me again. And my father always said, get a job. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you're a bit of a rebellious spirit. You don't care what they say. You're going to do you and you're going to sing the songs that you like and the songs that you want to sing and you're going to live your life your own way. Uh, is there a particular song that you love to sing more than any other? No, Frank Sinatra already stole it my way, so I can't do that one. Uh, <laughs> the song that means the most to me one of, it's actually one of the songs from my first album. No, I recorded in, be, in between my first and my second album. And it, and it's, is it on the second album? Yeah, it's called I Really Needed Me. Mm -hmm. um, What's that song about? All of my life I've, I've wanted someone to hold me close and tell me it's going to be all right. Most of my time I've spent in looking for someone else to tell me I would make it through the nights, the lonely nights when I really needed me. 
and the days, those hopeful days that someday I would be whole. Well, it sounds like that song has a lot of deep meaning. Now, you've won a lot of awards for a lot of your songs. Can you tell me about your Juno win and some of your other accomplishments? Oh boy, okay. Um, well, I was voted, uh, well, we call it best new artist now, um, but the category was most promising female vocalist, AKA Kiss of Death. <laughs> And the next year I was uh, nominated, thankfully, in the top category. Mm -hmm. The first year that the Junos went on TV. It's often been mistakenly said that I won the first Juno. <laughs> no. But the first time it was televised, I was, I was nominated in the best female category, which I'm very proud of. Beat out only by Ann Murray, so I sent her a song. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, what other awards are there? Oh, I've had a citation from the Red Cross for singing the theme song, Free the Children in 1980. And, oh, uh, something from the government for my volunteer work with the Prime Mentors of Canada, uh, work with youth and uh, putting them together with the uh, mentors and the Prime Mentors provided a scholarship for these children once they graduated. So, and I personally, with Peter Mann, who produced the Nylons, we auditioned a hundred girls ourselves and ended up with a group called Savvy Cafe. And we left them in school, it was a project, and they were amazing and their music holds up today. It's just incredible. And what else? Um, a couple more things I can't remember. Oh, I've had an honor from the, uh, I guess Toronto or uh, uh, the late great Pete Otis was honoring Canadian musicians at the Black Swan. So I have a little plaque for that. Oh, and I, of course, honored on the Bureau, which was, you know, very, very nice to be included in uh, Toronto's living legends. Ooh, and I'm in the museum. The Friars Museum, which is free, folks, you can go see it. It's in the Shoppers Drug Mart head office at Dundas Square. So nice of them to dedicate 300, excuse me, 300 square feet of prime retail space for our music business. Wow. And yeah, my album is there right beside Jackie Shane and, uh, and David Clayton Thomas, right smack dab in the middle. I am so honored, I got to tell you. It's wonderful to go see the museum. It has a lot of artif artifacts and stuff from the band. It's got Dominic Trano, the great Dominic Trano from Mandela. May he rest in peace. It's got his suit, the striped suit. That's beautiful. You got to go. Well, it's almost exhausting for you to name all your achievements. Most people, maybe, maybe they can't like even fill a page of oh, their achievements and you it's like it's like a novel uh, which i guess you are working on a novel as well which yeah. uh, we'll have to check out yeah sorry for going on and on but no you know. no it's great to hear about it and especially someone who's had that many every achievement means a, a big deal something has happened and the, the fact that there's been so many just speaks to your talent your skill and how people even perceive you and love you are very kind. And validation is everything. To me, it's the other half of the paycheck. So and do I'm, you, yes. Go ahead. Oh, do you have anything else in the works currently or anything that you hope to do in the near future? I've been working on a show. COVID put, a, put the kibosh on that because it was a live show, but it's called Catharsis in Heels. Taken on the road is Catharsis in Heels on Wheels. It's about me. I'm. My name is Kathy, Catherine, root word, kathos. So is catharsis. The root word of catharsis, which is, of course, you know, a, a cleansing, a purification, uh, is katharos, the Greek word. So I am catharsis in heels. So do you ever add the and if you were to add lib a song um, or just say a few words about your time on the movement, what would it sound like? 
my time on the planet on on the segment this uh this oh, episode segment. Ah, you want you want me to you want me to spit some stuff okay here we go okay <laughs> Oh, Julia, I want to thank you for being such a nice girl. Julia, I want to thank you for letting me have a part of your world for even 20 minutes is right inside my heart. And I want to tell you our friendship, which I feel is starting now, <laughs> shall never, never part. Thank you, dear. Best wishes. I'm a big fan of yours. And I feel so good now because the love just pours. Woo! <laughs> wow. You are so talented. Just just right there, put on the spot and you wrote like a beautiful song. All your songs are beautiful. Oh my goodness, a, uh, a true born talent right over here. It was such a pleasure to interview you and thank you so much for your time and for uh, just coming on and speaking your heart. Thank you. I gotta tell you now, speaking about, about the heart, I wouldn't wanna play any other card this one is true. This one is new. Every second is beautiful with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Inbox with Julia Cosby on Tag TV.